South African military ombud has made some really worrying findings on the state of the SANDF. A report by the ombud has found that SANDF troops deployed in Mozambique were fed rotten food. The report has been handed over to the Joint Standing Committee on Defense. It's scheduled to be discussed in the coming week. To speak on the state of the SANDF, Garth Bennyworth, who is head of the Department of Heritage Studies at the Sol Plaki University, joins us now for that conversation. I'd like to separate these two incidences, Garth, uh, just for ease of navigation, the incident that, happened, that has to do with the food, etc., in Mozambique. But I would like to start with the situation in terms of the response to the flooding situation. When an event such as the riots in July last year or the flooding happens, South Africans are quick to say, bring in the South African National Defense Force. And indeed, you know, the sound of the Oryx helicopters, uh, you know, hovering above uh, in assisting with the rescue sort of gives you, lulls you into the sense that actually we have the capability. Our engineers will be on top of it. Water will be distributed to people by a capable SANDF. But is that the reality? Well, this is the thing, as, you've, as you mentioned to Lucesbe, is the reassurance of the RX helicopters and, and so forth. The preparedness is another matter. I mean, the SANDF is capable of operating on multiple fronts. So, for example, at present, um, they're operating not only in the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, as you mentioned, Mozambique as well, and also in anti-piracy operations in the Indian Ocean, in the Mozambican Channel. So there's that. Um, and there's also the training cycles too. So the point being is um, if we look at the capability of rapid deployment, we saw, we, saw, we saw a delay last year in the seditious riots that we saw in KZN, or particularly in Durban area. And unfortunately, the same areas and even broader have been hit badly again by this flooding. So yes, there are troops being deployed, um, but the point is, what is the preparedness? And preparedness is, goes much deeper than rapid deployment. It goes into your logistic cycles, not only in the SANDF, but it also goes into the entire procurement system. So we know about the cash liquidity crisis at Denel, problems with arms corps, and in fact, it even gets, it gets wider than that. So yeah, there has been delays, and I don't think those delays are a lack of will. It's actually a lack of resources. I mean, for example, you can only do what you can do with the budgets that you've got. And we've seen massive cuts in the national budget to the military over the last decade even. So, I mean, for instance, uh, the work of the engineer uh, formation, uh, Garth, how crucial is it at this time? Yes. Can the engineer formation rise to the occasion? For instance, I see my good friend Erica Gibson reporting that they, they intend to deliver some 90,000 liters, uh, liters of water uh, to communities. And in my mind, I was thinking that, you know, where you have a bridge that is strategically important and it's collapsed because of the floods, this is where we need the engineer formation to step in and fix all of that. What, what capability is there around that particular aspect? Well, exactly. I mean, the engineer formation has been involved in actually bridges, bridging before. And as you say, the, the, main, the main point with the arterial uh, economic lifeline between Teng and Richards Bay and even Durban as well, um, where bridges have actually been damaged or swept away, that is a vital need, and it's a critical need as rapidly as possible. The capability is there to actually do, to actually put that into place. The question remains in terms of the logistics is how rapidly can, in fact, that be deployed? And that again goes back to budgetary issues, amongst others. Yeah. And is this why, Garth, um, the, the, the question, whenever the question is asked, when people are calling for spending on defense, even in these difficult times, to rise to at least 1% of GDP uh, or more. Uh, is, this, is this the reason why that argument keeps being advanced? When people say, but why do you need to spend so much on defense? We are not at war. Are these the answers? Well, this is part of, this is part of the answer. I mean, the, the situation is that if, in fact, one doesn't have a capable and, and resourced uh, defence force. The defence force is not there to make war as such. The defence force is there as a national strategic asset, where in fact is to actually defend the sovereignty of the Republic, yes, on the one hand, should that become necessary. 
And we've seen materializing threats, for example, in Mozambique and elsewhere that didn't exist 10 years ago. And a lot of these systems and weapon systems and capability and force readiness take time to develop. So that's the one hand. On the other hand, we've also seen last year, for example, the sort of seditious rioting that was going on in KZN and looting and, and plundering and so on. That, that came out of basically nowhere for the, from the public perspective. And now, of course, we've seen devastating flooding and so on. Yeah. There, so there are, there are scenarios where, in fact, things can happen very suddenly and very rapidly, or in a military sense, escalate very quickly. And to respond to those emerging threats or sudden threats, whether they be climatic or whether they be political or economic, one has to have a force that is resourced and is capable to respond immediately. And that is where, in fact, defence cutbacks and defense, uh, lack of defence spending and investment poses a strategic threat. In that context, what have you made of the uh, report by the military ombud presented to uh, the Defence Committee in Parliament that has to do with this incident where uh, it's alleged that uh, the troops deployed in Mozambique um, ate contaminated food and, and, and water, and basically there was food poisoning incident there. And I see that uh, there's a quotation here from Baba Londenze of EWN, uh, quoting Velile Jonas from the military ombud as telling MPs that a mobile pantry uh, to store food was not available uh, when they did the in loco inspection. What do you make of all of that? What are the implications for that critical operation, which, you know, far from being just about peacekeeping from time to time actually involves uh, confrontation and combat? Well, this is the thing, is that, you know, one doesn't want to second-guess the ombud and the report that is yet pending. However, there, there, is a, there is a strong suggestion that, in fact, that that was the case or an allegation, which again itself proves back into, into logistics and the investment in logistics. One can deploy troops into these three various theatres, combat troops that is. So, for example, in Mozambique, special forces and infantry and the supporting elements. But, you know, for your own forces, if that is the case, to actually be brought down by um, a lack of refrigeration trucks working, working as they should work and being maintained as they should work, points to the greater Malay, and that is, in fact, a lack of investment into the Defence Force to maintain its core mission equipment, of which the logistical stuff such may be that as a refrigeration truck is part of it. It's on deployment, therefore it should work properly. Sure. All right, Garth, thank you. Um, uh, great talking to you once again. And I've got to thank you for your insights. Yeah. Uh, it's sad that we continue to lament. Uh, it would be nice for us to talk and say, since we last spoke, actually, things have moved uh, to this point. All we've seen is movement around expanding 200 million rand towards Cuba and buying interferon B under those seconds. Smuggling, not buying, smuggling interferon B into this country, the SANDF.